So this is Mankiw's 10 Principles of Economics translated. For those of you who don't know, Greg Mankiw, Harvard professor, wrote the best-selling economics textbook in the country. Based on these 10 principles, uh, I know the font is small, but take my word that you pretty much need a PhD in economics to understand these principles. Fortunately, I have one. So I've taken it upon myself to translate these principles for the more fortunate. We're going to begin by separating them into the first seven principles, which are microeconomics, and the last three, which are macroeconomics. The difference, of course, being that microeconomists are wrong about specific things, and macroeconomists are wrong about things in general. Uh, we're going to begin with the macro principles, 8, 9, and 10. Believe it or not, these all have the exact same translation, namely blah, blah, blah. Uh, as proof, I need only remind you that macroeconomists have successfully predicted nine out of the last five recessions. And as further proof, we can now go up one font size. Uh, let's go back to the micro principles now. The first one, people face trade-offs. This one is easy. Uh, translation choices are bad. This is a simple syllogism, right? Uh, trade-offs are bad. Anytime you have choices, you have trade-offs. Therefore, choices have to be bad. If you don't understand that, take a look at principle number two. The cost of something is what you give up to get it. Translation choices are really bad. Now, I have a little demonstration of this fact. So let's say that someone offers you a Snickers bar that you value at a dollar. Okay, then what you can loosely think of as your economic profit in this situation is the dollar of the Snickers bar minus the cost of what you give up to get it, which is nothing. Your economic profit is a dollar. To begin to understand why choices are bad, imagine that someone offers you a choice between the Snickers bar that you value at a dollar and some M&Ms that you value at 70 cents. Okay, now your economic profit is only 30 cents. You begin to understand why choices are bad. <laughs> the worst possible situation, in fact, is being offered a choice between a Snickers bar and an identical Snickers bar. <laughs> now, people who are not trained in economics might think that that's no different than just being offered one Snickers bar, but that kind of sloppy thinking will never get you a tenure-track position. Simplifying. Choices are bad. Choices are really bad. I'm not going to beat around the bush with you people. If you don't understand why choices are bad, you're probably stupid. <laughs> Moving on. Principle number three. Rational people think at the margin. Translation, people are stupid. <laughs> now, it is immediately obvious that people do not think at the margin. Nobody goes to the grocery store and says, I'm going to buy an orange. I'm going to buy another orange. I'm going to buy another orange. <laughs> people don't think like that. But if people don't think at the margin, and if, as Mankiw says, rational people do think at the margin, we are led to a most unhappy conclusion. People are not rational. People, in other words, are stupid. But before you despair for humanity, take a look at the next principle. People respond to incentives. Now, the dictionary says that incentive is a noun, and that it's a synonym for motive. So when Mankiw says that people respond to incentives, what he's saying is that people are motivated by motives. You might think this is a bit like saying that tautologies are tautological, right? I mean, people would have to be pretty stupid to be unmotivated by motives. But remember principle three. People are stupid. Okay. Hence the need for principle four to tell us that people aren't that stupid. Simplifying again, move on to every economist's favorite topic, free trade. Principle five, trade can make everyone better off. Translation, trade can make everyone worse off. Now, you may wonder how the translation of principle five is the opposite of the principle itself. I have a simple proof of this fact that will blow your mind. I want you to compare two statements. One of them is trade can make everyone better off, and the other one is trade will make everyone better off. Now, if you had to pick one of those two statements to put in your best-selling economics textbook, right, it's no contest. The second statement is clearly better. But Mankiw uses the first statement instead. And if you think about why, there's only one possible explanation. The second statement has got to be wrong. <laughs> in other words, trade can make some people worse off, and from there it's just a hop, skip, and a jump to trade can make everyone worse off. <laughs> I figured some of you would have some questions about this, so I added a footnote with some details. Eat your heart out. <laughs> now that we've cleared that up, I want you to see the last two principles. Markets are usually a good way to organize economic activity. Translation, governments are stupid. And governments can sometimes improve market outcomes. Governments aren't that stupid follow immediately from principle five in its translation. Right, if trade can make everyone better off, what the heck do we need government for? Just let people trade. But if trade can make everyone worse off, we better have a government around to stop people from trading. So there are the 10 principles of economics translated. I actually want to be serious here for just a couple of minutes and go back to this slide. And the idea in the footnote that trade can make everyone worse off, 
um, is actually a real example. So here's an example of trade making everyone worse off. Imagine that we live a very made up economics model. There are these three people, orange, pink, and blue. They all live in a small town. The town has an air pollution problem. And uh, all three of these people also, they're good Americans, so they have a garage that's full of stuff that they don't use. Okay, so now we're gonna see some trade. So first, orange sells a lawnmower to pink, and we can imagine that they each get $100 in value from that trade. Orange sells the lawnmower for $100, so it's just sitting in her garage. Pink would be willing to pay $200, she only has to pay $100, so she gets $100 in benefits. But when Pink starts using the lawnmower, there's a little bit of air pollution that develops around the town. And like I said, made up economic story, maybe we can monetize the health impacts from the air pollution at maybe $80 per person. Not just for orange and pink, but also for blue, which is of course the negative externality. Right? But notice that orange and pink each get $20 in net benefits, so they're gonna continue to make that trade. Okay, so now we're gonna see another trade, and I'll tell you a similar story. Pink sells a snowblower to blue. They each get $100 in benefits from that trade. Pink from selling the snowblower for 100 bucks. Blue would be willing to pay 200, she only has to pay 100, so she gets $100 in net benefits. But when blue starts using the snowblower, air pollution gets worse, an additional $80 in healthcare costs for everyone. And now we just complete the circle. Blue sells a leaf blower to orange. They get $100 in benefits each. Air pollution gets worse, an additional $80 in healthcare costs for everyone. And now if you just add up any one of these columns, you see that after all three of those trades, everybody ends up at minus 40. All right, so this is the tragedy of the commons, the prisoner's dilemma. Um, each person's trades are individually rational, but altogether they hurt everybody. If you want to belabor the point and make a connection to climate change, you could, I don't know, like label the people. Right, this is roughly what economists worry about when it comes to climate change. Uh, everything you need to know about climate change in a couple of slides. Uh, first of all, carbon emissions are going up. Nobody doubts this caused by burning fossil fuels and secondarily deforestation. Uh, secondly, there's a theory that says that if carbon emissions go up, uh, uh, temperatures, global temperatures are going to go up. This theory actually goes all the way back to this fellow, Arrhenius, who was a chemist in Sweden. In 1896, he made the first estimate of how much uh, temperatures would go up if we doubled CO2 in the atmosphere which we're on track to do uh, this, uh, this century. And his estimate from 1896 of about five degrees centigrade, nine degrees Fahrenheit, is still in the range that climate scientists talk about today. The big difference between where he was then and where we are now is that he thought that climate change was going to be awesome, because uh, he lived in Sweden. <laughs> um, and we tend to be a little more worried about what the impacts are gonna be. In any case, we have this fact that carbon emissions are going up. We have the theory that says that if carbon emissions go up, temperatures are gonna go up. So we can actually run the experiment, and here's the results so far. The blue dots are showing temperatures going up uh, over time, and the red lines here are actually the decadal averages, the average for each 10-year period. Look, here's the decadal average for the 1970s, and then here are uh, the decadal average for the 1980s. Each year in the 1980s was warmer than the average for the 1970s. Here's the decadal average for the 1990s. Each year in the 1990s was warmer than the average for the 1980s. Here's the decadal average for the 2000s. Each year in the 2000s, warmer than the average for the 1990s. Uh, so that's pretty impressive confirmation of what climate science has been talking about. Uh, fortunately, we can all come together uh, as economists on one thing, which is that the way economists think about climate change or other pollution problems is that the way to get less pollution is to make polluting expensive. How do you do that? You can use a carbon tax or an auction cap and trade system, but the goal of both of those policies is to drive up the price of fossil fuels because that gets market forces working to find alternatives and reduce consumption and all that good stuff that we love. The side benefit is that you can use that money for all sorts of good things, right? The money you get from uh, the tax on fossil fuels. And the idea that I like to talk about is that we could be using most or all of that money to reduce or eliminate existing taxes. So it's called environmental tax reform or tax shifting, right? And the underlying economics is that we should be taxing things that we want less of instead of taxing things that we want more of. And there's even a place that's done this. Uh, and this is something that economists should know more about. So uh, in British Columbia, they've done this policy. It's a brilliant policy. They have a carbon tax that applies to almost all uses of fossil fuels. By 2012, the tax is gonna be $30 per ton of CO2, 30 cents a gallon of gasoline equivalent of three cents a kilowatt hour of coal-fired power. That's 100% revenue neutral. All that money is being used to offset corporate and personal income taxes in the province of British Columbia. And the best thing about the policy uh, is that it was pushed by a premier, the governor of British Columbia, who's from the right of center uh, party up there. So really a terrific, um, uh, terrific policy that folks should uh, think about more and hopefully em emulate here in the States. And this is actually where I find common ground with folks, even people who don't believe in climate change. So George Will, uh, the Washington Post columnist, is not a believer in climate science, but uh, he came to one of my classes and uh, said that he would support replacing the payroll tax, the employment tax, with a carbon tax. 
um, uh, just because he hates the payroll tax, right? He thinks the shift to a consumption tax, which is like a carbon tax, would be a good thing. I asked him if he knew that Al Gore agreed with that idea also, and he said, well, he said, an idea should not be held responsible for the people who believe in it. 